This episode of Two and a Half Geeks is brought to you by Data Robotics Drobo. You may be familiar with Drobo for the home user, but for small to medium-sized companies, check out drobo.com slash business for simple, sophisticated storage solutions for the enterprise. Coming Baby. up on Two and a Half Geeks, we were talking about a main gear gaming notebook, a couple of graphics cards from AMD, contest info, and a whole lot more. The bar has been set wicked fast. It rocked in the benchmarks. We're going to up the ante uh, a little bit. Processing power, Maybe. I kind of understand this. Welcome to Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Aya Zaktar alongside Dave Altavilla and Marco Cipetta, the guys behind HotHardware.com. How are you guys doing? Fantabulous. Doing, and you? <laughs> doing, <laughs> you're doing what now? No, so I'm, I'm doing great. I'm just recovering from the Easter holiday. Okay. We hosted a couple of families here, so yeah. a little nuts. Marco was attacked by bunnies, uh, leaving eggs everywhere, but he's okay. Vicious. And he's it's just a rabbit. <laughs> so, a while back, you guys visited Main Gear. I saw this video. It was very exciting. You were harassing this guy named Wallace, I heard. Uh, I'm not really sure why you were harassing Wallace, but you were. Uh, Lastly, Wallace, yes. But uh, recently, there's been a review of a Main Gear EXL 15 gaming notebook at hot, hard, hot Hardware. Dave, what do you know about it? Yeah, it, it EXL15. It's got like a really sort of sporty name, doesn't it? Or maybe not. not. Really. <laughs> Lots of letters. It's not as cool as Anyways. XPS. Yeah. So, um, yeah, th this this is a notebook uh, built by the folks at Main Gear. And if you saw the, the nickel tour we gave you at the factory, you'll know these guys... They, they build machines and they mean business. Uh, th this was a 15-inch machine that uh, they put together. Really nice flat black finish on it, you know, rubberized, um, sort of industrial grade uh, finish. And uh, the notebook, I guess, you know, from a styling standpoint, it's very min minimalistic, um, very sort of subdued in its design, uh, high quality, super, you know, tight fit and finish. But what was most impressive about it was what these guys configured underneath that gave us probably the best benchmark scores we've seen from any 15-inch machine to date. Now, was there anything in particular Main Gear did to this machine? I know we, we saw their their desktops on that tour. What did they do to the hardware on the laptops that make it so special? You know, it, it, it's the subtle stuff. It, when when you get a, a a notebook from a manufacturer like a I don't know we we could name names, but big OEMs, Dell, HP, whoever. Um, sometimes, I mean, if you dial up the right SKU um, yourself, if you if you go to the website configuration utility and you, you pick all the right parts yourself and you configure a build that, you know, because you're knowledgeable and you know the component level stuff, you can get the sort of performance that perhaps the uh, the EXL15 from Main Gear can, can offer. But, but these guys, being the performance enthusiasts that they are, the model is pre-configured, it's set up, it's dialed in with you know, a, a complement of components that offer performance from all corners sort of you know, in unison. It, it, it's a little bit hard to explain, but, but basically the setup is just right. And that's what happened in the benchmarks. We've got, you know, a Core i7 2720QM quad core, 2.2 gig quad core, 8 gig of DDR3 system memory, NVIDIA's GeForce GTX 485M, which you just don't see in a lot of notebooks these days, much less in a 15 inch machine, a 500 gig Seagate Momentus uh, hybrid SSD hard drive, uh, which, you know, a little bit of flash memory up front for really fast access and a standard hard drive in the back. That's it's a combination hybrid hard drive. Combined together in a build that, you know, just dialed in, uh, you know, with, you know, all the latest drivers, zero bloatware, absolutely none. I mean, straight up stock Windows 7, 64-bit install, you know, with all the latest drivers, just set up perfect. And so when guys like us get stuff like that in and you throw it on the test bench, and it just works, the benchmark numbers speak for themselves, and that's what happened with this machine. Let's switch gears to the segment where Marco makes me scratch my head because I'm wondering. <laughs> Let's talk about some AMD graphics cards. I know you got two of them there, the AMD Radeon yep. HD 6670 and the 6570. These are mainstream GPUs right. from what I'm being told from this email sent to me by the guy who told me to read that. Marco, what, <laughs> what do we got going here? Who was that guy? 
So you, you set it up perfectly. We've got a couple of uh, new mainstream GPUs from AMD. Um, a couple of podcasts back, uh, we talked about the 6450, which is really entry-level DX11, you know, $50 graphics card. Now the 6650 and 6750 are a little higher end. We're talking 80 bucks and 100 bucks. Here's the uh, the $100 card here. This is the 6670. And what we're talking about here is something for somebody that wants to upgrade from a previous gen entry level card, upgrade from uh, you know integrated graphics. They want to be able to do some gaming, have all those great video features that uh, AMD and Nvidia offer in their graphics cards, but they don't necessarily care about you know ultra high frame rates. Uh, that's where these cards kind of drop in. So what else could you tell me about them? Because I mean they just seem like they're only a hundred bucks. Why are they so cheap? Is this do they seem cheap to you? Are they low cost? What what, what would you say about them? So this is this is like kind of the the funny thing with the last few graphics launches from both AMD and Nvidia. Um, you know, ninety nine dollars and down. It's you know from as far as the you know wallet busting factor is considered, it it is cheap. It's an affordable graphics card, but that kind of price range that 80 bucks to 100 is super super crowded right now with stuff from their previous generation and for the asking price of these cards you can get much faster cards um, that are literally within five dollars of the price point so the these cards they offer great feature sets you know it's the same feature set as higher end 6900 series cards so you have iAffinity you have the third gen uh, UVD uh, video engine you have all that cool stuff full DX11 support but if you strictly focus on game performance, they can be outperformed at the same price point. Now, what makes these you know, newer generation cards attractive is their, their low profile, you know, their half height cards, at least most of them will be. And they're also super low power and quiet. Um, 66 watts is the peak on a higher end card. So no extra power connectors, not a lot of heat pumping out. They'll stay quiet in like a home theater PC environment. But there, there are trade-offs. I think the last couple of launches, NVIDIA and AMD have been just pricing a little aggressively, a little bit high. But once the previous gen stuff clears out and these prices fall a little bit, they'll kind of be right where they should be. Let's start talking about smartphones. Hot Hardware has a review of the HTC Thunderbolt 4G Android smartphone. This thing is running on Verizon's LTE network. It's a monstrously large phone. What is it a 4.3 inch screen, I think? Uh, Dave, you guys got a review. What can you tell us but beyond actually moving the thing around in the camera's face? <laughs> there it is. There it is. Monstrously large. Yeah, it takes up a ton of the frame, doesn't it? Hmm. Um, yeah, 4.3-inch uh, TFT um, LCD screen. Yeah, not a super AMOLED screen. Really nice screen. Very large. Um, you know, and certainly well-equipped in terms of HTC's design. This thing, you know, if you're looking for a light phone, something that you can throw in your pocket and not know it's there, this isn't it. This this phone is built rock solid, really sturdy design, sort of rubberized casing in the back, kickstand, right, 4.3 inch, uh, you know, almost almost uh, standard issue for HTC phones that are larger screens these days. This, uh, you know, uh, kickstand signature kickstand, and then underneath the kickstand is the speaker area. Of the uh, of the handset, um, very well equipped phone. Um, Verizon's 4G LTE technology, no joke. Some of the best benchmarks we've seen. A um, little bit lacking on the core um, hardware side, the processor side of things. Uh, one gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon processor. Uh, you know, not the latest technology. It's been out there for a while. Didn't burn up the benchmarks in terms of general performance CPU or, or graphics, but in terms of network performance, kicked butt. Now, who is this phone actually targeted to? I mean, it's, it's a relatively large one, so it's not meant for, like, smaller people. It's, it's running Android, but it's running <laughs> HTC Sense UI. It's not, it doesn't have the stock Android experience. Like, who's the customer for this? Not, not for you smaller folk. <laughs> I don't know. I just found that funny. I don't know why. It's, well, I, it's because back when I was working at some other place, I, I had a friend of mine who was, who, who didn't understand these giant phones because, well, she's about 5'3", a very small, ah. petite young lady. And she's like, they're cutting out a huge segment of their market because these phones are ridiculously large. Now, you kept holding up the, uh, the, uh, <coughs> the Thunderbolt, and it is that 4.3-inch screen. Uh, but yes. I'm just curious about, like, it's still skinned. Why, why is HTC bothering to skin this? I, well, uh, can, I, don't can, go I, there, can I jump man. in for can one just, second? You can. Can I jump in for one sec, Dave? I'm okay. sorry to interrupt. 
jump. Um, I th- yeah, let, let me just jump in for one second. I think that phones like that that uh, have the custom skin and you know that large screen, some kind of questionable decisions all around. It's re- those phones are for content uh, consumers, people that are just going to use their phone to browse, watch video, play music, maybe do email. Um, you know, and they want a better web browsing experience. Don't really care about some of the extra, you know, bells and whistles. That HTC Sense makes it really easy to just get quick access to to messaging, to email, um, to the HTC video player. It's just a, you know, that that ease of use factor, and the nice screen makes it better for content consumption. Okay, sorry. Back to you, you Dave. You don't, <laughs> you don't need me. Marco just said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, no, he hit the nail on the head, Marco. I, absolutely, that's exactly what I was going to say. And 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 I would I would offer what I was about to say before he jumped in was that you, you're going to get the bull by the horns if you challenge me on HTC's Sense user interface. I'm a fan of it. I like it a lot. It really simplifies the Android experience. Really, you know, sort of sleeks it up where in in places where you know, quite frankly, you know, we're we're still working on things, or Google is still working on things for handsets in terms of the Android uh, UI. It, it's slick, but HTC, I think, does it w- one notch better. And yes, absolutely, big screen, tons of bandwidth if you can get a 4G LTE connection. And so, yeah, surfing the web, you know, much more with video, much more with audio, um, you know, consumption, content consumption on this handset is where it's at. That said, I, I wish it had a little bit better processor to go with that because obviously in that model, video, what have you, you, you want to have you know a little bit faster engine. In, in Nvidia's Tegra 2 would be great under the hood with this thing. It's not there. Maybe even you know it, not possible with HTC, but Samsung's Hummingbird is a little bit more media centric and media powerful, uh, capable processor. W- what I would say that's impressive is the capability of Verizon's 4G LTE network and what phones like this can do on it. We had to travel a little bit to get a 4G LTE connection. Uh, uh, you know, we're out here in the, uh, in the burbs, and we had to go about 20 minutes closer to Boston to get it. But once we got it, no joke, 39 meg down, 24 meg, excuse me, 39, yeah, 39 meg up, 24 meg down. It, it was like cable modem kind of speeds with when, when you had a five-bar signal. So, I mean, really, 4G done right? Wish we had a couple more uh, processor cycles under the hood, but a nice phone with a big screen, and it's purdy and ready to web surf. One more question about that phone. Now, considering the giant screen, 4G, what's the battery life like? If, if you're you know, using that 4G radio and you're, you're surfing the web constantly, we have a, a, a refresh test that we do uh, browsing the web, you know, looking at, at uh, web pages, the, the hard hardware page specifically. Um, it, it lasted about 3 hours and 36 minutes, and that's, again, you know, doing average web surfing, you know, refreshing to a new page every few minutes. And so 3 hours and 36 minutes doesn't sound like a lot, but our editor, um, um, Jen, um, Johnson that tested this machine actually worked with it, uh, you know, sort of an average daily on-off use, making calls, surfing the web, pulling up email, and it lasted about 14 hours in her estimation. So Jen did a good job testing that out, and and so you know, an average daily use, yeah, it, it it's got the battery life there, and you know, the, the Qualcomm Snapdragon processor kicks down a gear for you. If you're going to surf the web over 4G all day long, yeah, you're going to last about you know three hours and 36 minutes. Well, let's move to, <laughs> to, some, be exact. to some hardware that we usually don't talk about. Let's talk about speakers and headsets. Now, this I found unusual that's even in the lineup. This is from Corsair, the SP2500 2.1 speaker system and the HS1A headset. Marco, if you're bringing this up on the show, it must be something special. It, it actually, um, I'm, I was really excited to look at this product. I, I kind of had a feeling you were going to, you know, question it a little bit and throw a little jab in there because it's only a 2.1 speaker system, you know, and a, and a basic man. analog headset. <laughs> but the technology that Corsair employed in this speaker system, you know, it really demands attention if you want high quality audio and you don't have the, uh, the type of room or the environment to set up a true multi-channel setup. So what's really interesting about the SP2500s um, is basically the configuration of all the speakers. There's an 8-inch, 120-watt sub inside a fourth order bandpass tune port enclosure. So what that means, it's, it's a special kind of enclosure that it, it limits the, the frequency band um, of the sub somewhat, but it's really efficient and within its supported frequencies, it's really clean with very, very minimal distortion. 
And the satellites, um, there's individual mid-ranges and tweeters, and all of the drivers, all of the individual drivers in the speaker system have their own DSP and Class D amp. So the crossover points are really specific. Um, you know, the power band's really specific. You can't really overpower them. And at basically any volume level, you get crystal clear, almost perfect audio. It's, it's a really, really nice speaker system. Now, just because I'm a home theater guy doesn't mean I was going to take a jab at this right off the bat. If anything, <laughs> I'm a fan of things that don't need these ridiculous 5.1, 7.1, 9.1. They, they're going into a, a different right. realm. I've actually seen a couple of uh, other shows where they're talking about breaking the plane. Normally, the audio is on one plane. Now, they're going to go vertical. Yep. So, 2.1 is fine. Cause it's vertical. Okay, good. I got two ears. They should figure that out. What about this headset? So the headset, I kind of I wanted to toss into this review because I, I found it to be just the perfect companion for the 2500s. The, the control pod for the SP2500s has the, the headphone jack right there. And because this is a, you know, a standard analog speaker system, um, even though it has this complex amp and DSP setup, it's just a super clean setup. You want to switch to your headphones, you have your control pod right on your desk. You just plug them right into the control pod, and the, the HS1As are a really affordable analog headset that's comfortable and really good sound quality. Again, Corsair didn't muddle things and try to cram you know a bunch of different speakers and drivers into the headset. It's just a clean, you know, two speaker setup, you know, one for each ear, and it sounded really good and they're affordable. So I just thought they made a great companion to the SP2500s and wanted to include them right in the article where people would be interested in reading about it. Dave, it's contest update time. <laughs> yeah, -ho! go for it. <laughs> well, we have a winner. How's that? <clears throat> yep, we, uh, we, we have gone ahead and culled through the mountain of people that have entered the hot hardware killer 3D gaming rig spring fling sweepstakes. Boy, that's a mouthful. Tongue twister. And uh, with the good folks at Main Gear and NVIDIA and Intel and Patriot and Asus and my God, you know, it's like, you know, a who's who of technology to build this system. And it is just awesome. Uh, a Main Gear shift machine with a 3.4 gig Core i7, Sandy Bridge processor, 16 gig of Patriot memory, liquid cooled NVIDIA 3D Vision with a pair of uh, GeForce GTX 580 graphics cards. I mean, it's just like over the top and it's no wonder we've got like 622 to be exact not like comments so far it's still coming i mean absolutely the most engaging contest we've had so far and we have picked a winner and we will announce it soon but we can't tell you right now we're going to keep you in suspense because <laughs> we're, we're you know we're just evil like that <laughs> are, are there any other contests since this contest is closed and somebody's already won can you drop any hints about what's coming up? Yes. Uh, there is a new contest coming up. We are already engaged with manufacturers of the major brand name, uh, level, quality, what have you, uh, that will assist in assembling components. And we vowed to bring you yet another awe-inspiring uh, prize to offer up to the masses. <laughs> Um, and I would also say, and I almost forgot this, see, behold, in front of you is a hothardware.com 2 gig USB flash drive, baby. Look at that. <laughs> Jackknife. It, it, you know what's cool about it? It's, you know it's hot hardware because if you look closely, translucent blue inner casing to the, the USB part, you can see the components. There's the flash chip. There's the controller. <laughs> Very cool. And we're going to give these to the e top e 10 runner-ups of the contest for the uh, the Spring Fling sweepstakes because we appreciate all the contributions. Top 10 folks, you guys are going to get these because we love you. Yeah, and that obviously is an obvious hint uh, to the next contest. Whatever is going to be given away will have a USB port. It's a chance. Uh, at least one. You're, you're, you're I know. I'm a sneaky guy. Cat. Oh, by <laughs> the way, viewers, if, if you want to know a little bit more about the stuff we talked about, you should check out hothardware.com. That's where all the stories uh, we talked about are. Or you can go around the web over at facebook.com slash hot hardware or dig.com slash hot hardware or twitter.com slash hot hardware. If you want to watch more videos, always you can check out youtube.com slash hot hardware vids. And that pretty much wraps up this episode. We will see everybody next week. Thanks for stopping by.